Hello, everybody. It's Rob Shapiro from In the Mind of. Today, we're gonna we're with Rob Penarello from Professional Physical Therapy. Rob and I have known each other for over thirty years. Rob is my clinical instructor at Special Surgery, and years ago, and just learned tons from him over the years. Uh, we keep reconnecting for different things professionally, and it's been great. So now, Rob is our Chief Clinical Officer, at Professional. I'm the Director of Clinical Excellence. So we work together all the time. Rob, besides that, he's an athletic trainer, uh, strength and conditioning coach, a physical therapist, a teacher a mentor. So a lot of different roles. Um, Rob has worked with professional athletes, college athletes, high school athletes, probably all different ages, as well as the everyday patient. Um, so Rob, it's been fun to kind of hang out with you. And so today we're going to talk about stuff that we've, you know, you and I sit in an office, we could talk for hours and we said we should have put a microphone. So this is our chance. Here's our microphone for the next 20 minutes, but welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. It has been a fun ride. I enjoy my time with you and a lot of other people in the company as well. So we're going to start just a quick question, like coming out of school, like where do we start? Where's a new grad? You know, what do you recommend to a new grad? How do you get to another level in your career? Um, yeah, I mean, thoughts? you know, from my experiences and, and speaking with others, I, I think that when you get out of school, when you first get out of school, you should take a job where, most apt to learn as much as you can to develop both your knowledge and your skill proficiencies. And the reason why I say that, I'm going to uh, assume, you know, they say about assume, but most people coming out of school initially, especially if you coming out of a program right out of high school to college and right out, not making light of your debt, meaning college loans, maybe a car loan or things like that but you're probably not going to be responsible financially coming out of college in most instances as someone as you're going to be later on in life with a mortgage, a family, et cetera. And so I think that if you become the best physical therapist you could be or best occupational therapist or best clinician that you can be, then later on in life, you know, people are going to want the best to take care of them, right? If, if, if you're on trial for murder, you know, God forbid, you, you want the best attorney to represent you because they're the ones that are going to get you off. If you, um, you know, if you had quadruple bypass, if that was necessary, you want the best cardio, cardiothoracic surgeon to take care of you. So if you want rehab, um, you know, you're going to want the best people in rehab to take care of you. And thus, that establishes a uh, you know job security, whether it's financial, you know, because if people want you, they'll they'll pay for you, and you know security in regards to getting referrals and having whether it's direct access of relationships with physicians, sending you patients because you're good at what you do, and um, you know once you're at that level, then hopefully the finances and everything else take care of themselves. I truly never worried about the finances. I always was concerned about trying to be as good as I can be, thinking of that philosophy, and, and that's what worked for me. So that's what I advise people. You first come out of school, yeah. go somewhere where you're really going to learn to prepare yourself in your future. Right. I mean, one of the parts that we, we know we've kind of um, taken on as the education department uh, is the hierarchy of athletic development that you and Al Vermeil developed. Tell us a little bit more about that and why it's important. Well, you know, Alvin Meal is a good friend and a mentor. He has this hierarchy of athletic development. He's the one that developed it. I just took and tried to modify it in rehab with others like, you know, yourself, Tim Stump, um, who's no longer here, you know, our, our clinical excellence department, et cetera. So, you know, I've always found that, you know, you're better off working with a bunch of people, right? The old saying, again, all of us are a lot smarter than one of us. And so, uh, you know, we've evolved this. And, uh, you know, essentially this hierarchy is just a, an evaluation and a testing basic uh, premise and then how to go through various physical qualities and in regards to training athletes or, um, you know, in the rehab process, uh, you know, when is most appropriate to uh, emphasize a certain physical quality because uh, it's not just about strength and, and, and other physical qualities. It's about continuum of all of them working together. So, it's just so what is a cover of physical quality? What would people – we understand it. How would you describe it to somebody who didn't know what you're even yeah, saying with that? The easiest way to make the easiest analogy is if you took a hundred meter dash, right? If you have a, a sprinter running a hundred yards or a hundred meters, when, when they come out of the blocks, that ability is really basic, uh, uh, basically uh, 
due to their, their levels of strength, this physical quality strength, right? They push into a block and mechanically push into the block and they propel their body. When you add velocity to it, right, because they're building up speed, well, velocity plus strength, that's power. So as they increase their velocity, as they're accelerating, they're becoming more powerful. They're using this physical quality of power. As they approach terminal acceleration and initial top speeds, they're in an upright position, and it's not a mechanical application of force into the ground. They're actually rebounding from the ground or being elastic and reacting to the ground. And so that's kind of like being plyometric. And then you really hit top speed. And if you look at that in reverse, well, to hit top speed, you have to be optimally elastic. And to be optimally elastic, you should be optimally powerful. And if you're to be optimally powerful, you have to have optimal strength levels. And so that's the hierarchy, you know? Each physical quality is dependent upon its predecessor, the optimal development of its predecessor, depending upon the goals of the patient and the athlete presented to you. So, for instance, maybe, a, and, and no offense to any athletes, a, a fencer, right? Someone who competes in fencing in the Olympics probably doesn't have to be as strong as an offensive lineman in football. So, again, it's based on the goals that you have for your athletes or your patients. So where do you start? So kind of go back to the basics of the, of the pyramid. Like where do you, what do you start with and what's next? Kind of go through the different well, levels. You, you have to evaluate someone because you want to know what their, their, uh, their positives are, right? Their advantages are, where, where are their strengths? But you also have to know what their weaknesses are because they're going to correlate with each other. So you want to know what deficits there are. You know, we've been doing a study for four or five years now looking at return to play in the ACL athlete. And I can tell you that, the problem with people returning to play are twofold. One, they're not strong enough. And two, um, they don't have the ability to react to the ground very well, whether that's due to kinesiophobia, which is the fear of either applying force or accepting force, um, because Newton's laws, right, the third law of motion, for every action is an equal and opposite reaction. So when you hit the ground, the ground hits you back. And, um, you know, whether it's due to fear, whether it's due to a lack of a physical quality, whatever it may be. Um, we're finding a lot of people, probably, and females more than males, um, are probably not optimally strong and physically developed prior to their injury. So now they're even uh, falling further behind the eight ball as they go through the rehab process. So you have to test them. Right. And you have to look so evaluations at first, and then where do you go? So I want to kind of, right, then where do you go up the pyramid? What's the next? The next, the next thing is, well, the re rehab is, is mobility and movement and muscle re-education. And so what do I mean by that? I mean, you have to restore range of motion. If you're going to exercise, you have to, to perform the exercise properly, right? You have to be technically proficient before the exercise. And then you need muscle re-education. You know, you have um, upper genetic inhibition with some of these surgeries, whether it's tourniquet time, trauma, you know, quads, quads will shut down. So you have to re-educate and get the quad firing again. So if you can assume the exercise positions and you can have the muscles firing, then you could progress to what we call work capacity. And you need to develop a work capacity through various efforts, whether it's cardiovascular, strength, any combination of whatever, uh, again, depending on the person presented in front of you, because you want to have the ability to perform exercise over prolonged periods without over-fatiguing, okay? So whether that's in your rehab session, whether that's a rehab week of sessions, whether that's a month of, se month of sessions, or the total rehab period, right? You want to optimally perform through your rehab, but the other thing your work capacity gives you is it has you recover well so that you go back to your next subsequent rehab session with a full tank of gas, so to speak, so that you can opt to be performed again. And then once you go there, then you have the different physical qualities, strength, power, explosive strength, elastic reactive strength, or people want to refer to as plyometric, and then speed. But again, strength is the foundation. And, and think of it this way. If we define strength as the ability to produce force, and you don't have optimal levels of strength, 
well, then how are you going to advance to the next level? How can you possibly, how possibly produce strength quickly if you can't produce it at all? And so strength is the foundation of all the physical qualities for the advancement in that hierarchy. Right. So it goes evaluation, then it becomes the idea of getting mobility back, mm -hmm. work capacity, strength, yeah. power, elastic strength. Yeah. You call muscle re-education. Now, some, some factors of muscle re-education are getting rid of or eliminating noxious stimulus, right? Pain, edema, those types of things. Because those things have a negative effect on strength and the ability of movement, etc. So, you know, this all ties in together. It's not just segmented into silos. They all overlap. They all work together. So if I want mobility and movement, well, it's not only my ability to apply force and, and you know, with movement. If you think of strength with movement, right, how can you move unless you apply force? So you need certain levels of strength to move. But if I'm prohibited in, in uh, optimal movement patterns because of edema or pain or any other noxious stimulus, then as we're improving some characteristics, we have to eliminate the noxious stimuli as well going through these programs. The other thing is depending on, you know, the patient, et cetera, there's a, there's a, a factor called kinesiophobia, right? So when someone, when they get injured and they have surgery, they have two traumas. They have the trauma of the injury and then they have the invasive trauma of surgery. So they may have a fear of applying force and moving and doing things because they don't want to re-injure that limb that was just surgically repaired. And the only way you're going to build confidence, and I've learned this from coaching, is confidence is achieved by demonstrated ability. You can't dream it up. You can't buy it. You can't do anything else with it. You, that's why teams, right? If teams win three, four games in a row, they start to de get, develop confidence. We're a pretty good team. We could beat anybody. Well, it is your patient starts to apply force and accepts force on their extremity or, you know, whatever surgical part of the body they've had the procedure, then they're building confidence to the snowballs going downhill. I can apply more force. I can accept more force. And with that demonstrated ability, you eliminate the fear factor, the kinesiophobia. And um, I think that's really important to do that early in the rehab it's because, you know, to establish confidence. and But the way to establish confidence is to apply and accept loads. Right? So that's the right. So what are the biggest, so the rehab side of it, you know, what are the biggest errors we see with our clinicians early on in rehab? Um, I guess post-op might be different, post-op versus non-post-op. Yeah, I think, I think we're pretty good um, uh, overall, but I think where there's a weakness, I think we're pretty good on the initial phases of rehab, I think as you progress to, and, and sometimes the payers don't even let you go this long, but as you progress to six weeks and further, I think um, we're not as good as we are at the initial phases of rehab, had it take somebody to cross the finish line. I think, um, you know, and I think that's not just with some of the therapists I've seen working with us, I've seen that with therapists from other companies or other people I've spoken to across the country. You know, the, you, you decrease pain, edema, you establish this mobility, everything we've spoken about. Now a person's at a certain level of strength. Well, you know, what is the thought process of, of progressing them? So, for instance, and I speak about ACLs a lot because it's an interest and a lot of people see ACLs and have that interest, okay? But in most protocols, you're supposed to start running it 12 weeks, but if someone's not strong enough to withstand the reactive forces or apply forces, you know, at 12 weeks, you have to look at what's presented in front of you and maybe call the physician and say, listen, I need another two or three weeks because they're not strong enough to propel their body at optimal speeds at this point in time in the rehab. And if they can't propel themselves at optimal speeds, they certainly can't break and change direction at op optimal speeds, right? They're reactive part of the equation. And so I don't think I should start running them now. You know, I think I need to develop more qualities. And so you just can't look and go by the protocol at this point in time. Yes, you may have sufficient healing, but you may not have a sufficient development of qualities, right? Maybe there's a term called ligament dominance. If, you're, if you don't have sufficient strength levels, then the joint is supported more 
by ligaments than by soft tissue structure, right? Contractile soft tissue structures. And so we don't want to be ligament dominant. We don't want to overstress ligaments, especially one that was just repaired. And so why would I start running someone if they have deficits in physical qualities? It doesn't matter what the, the protocol says. It matters what's presented in front of you. And it may not be your fault as a clinician. It may be someone that was non-compliant in their therapy. Maybe someone that perhaps had an infection, and so they had more of a delayed start. So that 12-week period is, is on paper. That's the art of what we do. You know, what are we evaluating, and then how are we determining how to progress? A lot of it is science, but a lot of it is the art of, of what we do. All right. So how do you tell? I mean, that's the hard part. We talk about it all the time, and we kind of go back. And your answer is always, which is great, is experience and you know. But how do you know strength when they're strong enough, when to push them, how to push them? Besides I mean, experience, what if you have a mentor? Yeah, you can. It, I don't think it's any different. I mean, it's not, it's not um, to me, it's, it is experience, right? When you get into certain difficult situations that you've not seen before, right? You have to figure things out. But, you know, if someone does a straight leg raise, with just the weight of their leg, and let's just say they're going to do three sets of 10, the classic three sets of 10. If that's easy, you put on a weight, one pound, two pounds, whatever. If someone is squatting and training for sports and they have 400 pounds on the bar and they do that pretty easily, then I can add 5, 10, 15 pounds. The, the concept's the same. It's just, you know, that's what I mean. Some of it is um, – you know, judgmental. That's the art of what we do. Now, there's a, we've talked about this too. There's a system called the DAPNI system, and you do, uh, let's say, 50% for 10, 75% for 10 reps, 100% for 10 reps, and, and then you have a fourth set, which is your work set. You may say, I'm going to increase the weight or decrease the weight or keep it the same, possibly dependent upon, likely dependent upon how the performance of that third set was. So if the third set went okay, you may say, all right, my fourth set's going to be a little heavier, but it won't be for 10 repetitions. It'll only be for five. If the third set was very difficult, then the fourth set wouldn't increase at all. So a lot of it is, is common sense. You know, we, we used to talk about squatting our athletes in the 80s as part of rehab, and the physicians I worked with at the time at the Hospital for Special Surgery were okay with it, but they said, okay, but no four or 500 pounds. I'm like, Who's going to put four or 500 pounds on somebody's day one? So, again, it's just a factor of good common sense, what the science tells you, and then the art. You know, I'll make an analogy. When you are working with people, Rob, you have great hands. You have a certain feel. That feels not in a textbook. That feels just something that occurred and was developed over time. You know, how, how hard, how often, mobilization, Thrust, soft tissue, what type of massage, uh, relaxing, stimulating, all those things. Those things are supported by uh, science, but, you know, you have to have a feel with it as well. All right. So one of the questions has always been, like, uh, you know, s squatting, right? People who are against or for, like, you know, patellofemoral, all these different issues. People, yep. you know, think about how do we know that squatting is okay and not okay? That's what people worry about. People, you know, people even today will say, oh, you shouldn't squat, you're going to hurt their patellofemoral joints. Yeah, well, that's what you have to look at. That's the order of what we do. So let's just, so when we sit in and out of a chair, we're squatting, right? Or on and off a toilet, on and off a couch, especially a low couch that's a deep squat. We get in and out of a car that's a single leg squat. Up and down stairs is a single leg mini squats. So we're squatting every day in life. So now the question is, how deep, how often, the type of squat, whatever. So if you have someone that is diagnosed with a um, herniated disc, right, like a severe herniated disc, you probably wouldn't back squat, right, or box squat because you're going to have more trunk flexion. And, and I don't believe that in a lot of cases as you increase the weight on a bar, probably more than 75% of their capacity that you keep neutral spine. It looks that way, but probably in reality, you don't. Um, so you may front squat them or you may do something. Uh, you may decide to go what I call bottom up or top down. You could squat with the bars on the back or the front of the shoulders and a front squat. And we could lift the ground, the bar off the ground, a deadlift or a trap bar deadlift, if that's more feasible. So someone has a disc problem, you may avoid it. You may leg press them or something. 
If someone's patellofemoral problems, or like an acute ACL where they use central third patella tendon, where you violated the anterior aspect of the patella tendon, then maybe you want to wait before you front squat because the knees translate further than they back squat, right? Increasing patellofemoral compressive forces and loads across the patella tendon. We've well, just harvested harvested a third of this tendon. If you want to if you want to avoid everything altogether, then maybe you'll say I'll split squat. All right, I'll go a lunge or I'll do what's called a Bulgarian squat or real elevated split squat where the trunk is aligned vertically. However, with a split squat position, you increase the stress of the sacroiliac joint. And SI joint is 30% of all low back pain, give or take, depending who you read. So you have to look at what's presented in front of you. You know, it's not just getting the quad stronger. It's, you know, essentially what are the other concomitant pathologies that may be occurring here. You have a posterior horn of a meniscus. You probably can't squat deep for a while, but we know that the deepest position of the squat is where you have the highest EMG activity. So we want to get there eventually. It's just a matter of when. If you go through a range of motion, you're going to hit an open OCD lesion. That's painful. You're going to avoid that range of motion. So, you know, just because an exercise exists doesn't mean you have to use it. But my point is, if you're going to go through a squatting motion, there are different stresses with a box squat versus a back squat versus a front squat versus a split squat. And you have to understand how the body's being loaded with those types of stresses. There's also a difference in stresses with the barbell on your shoulders versus a barbell being lifted from the ground. So, you know, pick your poison. The only thing I will say is this, is that no exercise is safe, right? Because for us to adapt in strength or any physical quality, the stress we apply has to be unaccustomed. That's how an adaptation takes place. So we'll go back to the person doing the single leg raises one, one day post-op after surgery. Three sets of 10 was easy. We put on a one pound weight. Maybe it's a little bit more difficult. Eventually that one pound weight, even though it's not a lot of weight, it's unaccustomed to them for, that, for the physical condition they're in. And so they have to master one pound before they proceed. So whether it's one pound, 400 pounds, or anything in between, for adaptation to occur, the stress has to be unaccustomed. If the stress is unaccustomed, then you're taxing them in a way they're not used to. And, if, and that can be dangerous if not applied appropriately, right? So if, if an exercise is truly safe where it's always easy, and no adaptations taking place, then all we're doing is wasting our time. So again, right. that's the art. We may increase by one pound, not by fifty pounds, right? So right. Yeah, I think the interesting part with, of all that that the, what PTs tend to do is under we don't majority of PTs. If you look in the clinic, you look at anybody, you look at their flow charts. It's a lot of one pound, two pound. You don't see a lot of loading. Yeah. You know, which is interesting. Yeah, and, that, right? and I believe, yeah, no, you're right. And I believe you do have to load. And, and a concept that was taught to me years ago um, that is easy to understand but hard to accept is if you load somebody at 90, 95% of their ability, that's still maximal, right? So the weight may be heavy, but it's still submaximal. It's still safe as long as you know with that heavy load, which could be one pound or 400 pounds, depending on the situation and the person, you know, it's still, it's, like I said, it's not dangerous. What's dangerous is trying to do that too often. So submaximal right. is safe, right? It's just how often are you going to try to lift this heavy load that's submaximal? So. You shouldn't be afraid to load. You should just be conscious of how often you're loading someone close to their ability. Right. One thing you talk about all the time, it's kind of made more sense than the last, you know, tell me more, more, you know, repeat it so I kind of get it is that, you know, we're okay to do somebody, I'd rather do a heavier weight and just do that reps because of the volume, right? Because if repeated is what gives us tendonitis or breakdown, but if we can get a heavier load and less reps and get it, you might get a better, yeah, well, the, the analogy okay. I'll make there is, and, and listen, I try to be a simple guy because it's just the easiest way to understand. So let's just talk about the United States weightlifting. I just spoke to some friends of mine at USA weightlifting. Uh, hasn't changed too much. Um, a guy I know was a head coach in the 90s. His name was Dragomir Carlson. 
Now, there's different ways to us to establish without getting into how you count reps, but give or take, they probably do 25,000 exercise repetitions in a year annually. 2020, they do about the same thing, depending or less, depending on the skill level of the weightlifting athlete. My point is, these are weightlifters who are trained for loading their body, and they probably do give or take 25,000 reps of exercise, total reps a year. If you do 10 exercises in the clinic, which happens at certain points in time, and you do three sets of 10 for 10 exercises, that equates to an annual exercise volume of about 43,000 repetitions in a year. And so it's not how, it's not, more's not better. It's the quality of work, not the quantity of work. Now that said, you do have to develop a certain work capacity, right? You have to increase workloads so that the person can be successful in the tasks at hand. So a marathoner can't just run one mile efficiently, right? They have to run 20, over 26 miles. Do they have to run 100 miles efficiently? Efficiently, Probably not, but the ultra marathon it does. So, again, it depends on the task in front of you, but more is not better. And we do have to load people because that's what's going to build the confidence for them to apply load and accept load through the various increases in strength, which gives you stability, et cetera. And so if they get a lot of positive feedback, Due to the fact that they see improvement physically, then these these fear is going to take care of itself. I do believe that. They'll always may have a little bit, but you, you, you can make a marked improvement. And the way to do that is they have to have confidence in loading. And the only way to have confidence in loading, whether it's everyday life tasks or 400 pounds on a barbell, is um, by loading them appropriately. Right. Cool. Can actually talk for hours so we're gonna keep we'll cut it here and then we'll we'll do this again i appreciate your time great stuff so thanks so for having me i hope stuff. uh give some information that would help people clinically so i just appreciate cool. anybody watching this i appreciate your interest and everybody have a great day you too thanks this is rob shapiro from in the mind of